If you have an interest in horses and love learning more about horses, the horse industry, teaching, or even managing your own horse business, then you're in the right place. We would love you to join us on our mission, which is to improve the lives of horses around the world through the education of riders, handlers, and trainers. So get comfortable, listen in, and enjoy. Our guest today is Catherine Shriver. Now, Catherine's been on a few times before. She's from Dharma Horse, Dharma Horse Equine Century and Herbal Stable Yard. And Catherine is a herbalist, health, natural health consultant, veterinary assistant, Reiki master. She runs an equine century with her husband, Mark. You, if you'd like to know a little bit more about that side of things, just go to horsechats.com and search for Catherine Schreiber uh, and you'll find out a little bit more about her background. And Catherine always comes on with doing the best thing for the horse. You know, doing the best thing for the horse, what can we do to understand horses a bit more? What can we do to think about special needs equines? And, um, you know, I think today we're going to talk about 10 points of gentle hoof care. Is that right, Catherine? Yes, it is, Glennis. Wonderful, wonderful. Catherine, before we start, I've just got to remind people that the podcast is brought to you by International Horse College. The mission of International Horse College is to improve the welfare of horses around the world through the safe education of riders, handlers and trainers. And I know, Catherine, that's sort of something that you're you're imp- helping to improve as well, is improving the welfare of horses throughout the world. So we can sort of join you with that. But meanwhile, have a look at the variety of horse courses now available at International Horse College, Registered Training Organisation, number 31352. Now, Catherine, these 10 points of gentle hoof care, why this one? You know, because you always, you know, you always have ones that are focused on the work you do around the horses. Have you had any horses in particular or is this a general thing? Is this more about educating people because you found that that people lack lack the knowledge in this area? I think that's a... A good point that a lot of times people aren't as aware of the hoof itself. Mm -hmm. Um, A lot of the horses, a preponderance of the horses that come to us in sanctuary have had sometimes very severe hoof problems and they're not finding answers or um, support in what they want to do to heal it or to, to grow a new hoof and get the horse, you know, on a better, a more comfortable track, so to speak. And that like the more we learn as a horse society, the more we're learning about the hoof, the more we're returning to nature and and what the horse needs for his hooves to be healthy. And I think that that's something that we are discovering constantly okay. uh, with the sanctuary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you said about growing a new hoof, so the hoof is alive, mm-hmm. isn't it? You know, we just want to clarify yeah. it is a live part of the horse. Yep. Ex- exactly. It's dynamic. Um, the hoof itself is full of blood supply, full of nerves. It is flexible. It is not this object at the end that is designed for us to make it look pretty. <laughs> it's mm. important to know that a lot of times people will say that, the oh, the hoof is like your fingernail. And it's like the tip of your finger. The fingernail is what we would just describe the wall of the hoof. Is that, you know, hard cutaneous structure that Mm, mm. if we had our fingernail went all the way around the tip of our finger, that would be like the wall inside that bone at the end of my finger. It's just like the coffin bone inside the hoof capsule. And that's the uh, third phalanx or the P3, that coffin bone. Yep. And it's such, such an important part of the structure, such an important foundation for the horse, its support and the way the structures are designed to support that coffin bone is like the basis of soundness in a horse. Yeah. It's alive. <laughs> yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. And I know that you work as a herbalist, you know, and you, you do a lot of work with the feed, mm-hmm. the feed that's available in your area, but just with herbs. And now the feet themselves, they need to be fed, don't they? You know, feed the feet. Feed the feet. and. Yep. What we find a lot of times that horses come, they've been on a diet um, designed for livestock, Mm -hmm. um, designed to fatten up, to create a lot of, forgive me, muscle for meat kind of thing. And that philosophy just sort of extrapolated into the horse world. So they're getting uh, grains that are unnatural for them. 
a hay-based diet is the healthiest thing for a horse, grass haze. Because of where we live, we supplement alfalfa or lucerne, mm-hmm. and we find that that's, that's a healthy alternative to feeding grains and animal fats and all the strange things that are in the composite feeds. And the truth is that what the horses need are, are pretty simple. And the way the hoof is designed, it has a lot of, of protein. All Our bodies are created by protein by proteins, and those are amino acids. So what happens is we we eat a protein, like I say, the alfalfa is high in protein. We eat the protein, the horse does, and the digestion breaks it down into the amino acids. The bloodstream takes it to places in the body where it's restructured into the cutaneous structures or the muscular structures. So the high quality amino acids that we feed in a protein source are then used to create the hoof. And if we overfeed the protein or we feed a lot of fat or we do things that that change how the hoof is growing, we see that the changes in the feed show up in the hoof. And you'll see rings um, where something has changed in the horse's diet. And as the hoof grows down, you see that, that place where there's a ring or a bump. And a lot of times what we have to do to grow that new hoof is to change the way we're thinking about their diet. We use a lot of herbs. The um, best ones for the hoof are uh, the rose hips and kelp. We feed that a lot for working with the hooves. The amino acids that we supplement a lot are lysine and methionine because those are needed by the hooves, needed by the skin. Minerals are absolutely essential. So many times a uh, good mineralized salt, like a Himalayan salt, Uh, can be added and you'll notice the hoof structure change. The hoof will actually improve because of all the good minerals, especially the magnesium that's in that salt and the sodium. And you'll find that it's a hard thing because it's a gradual process. Because the hoof can be shaped, because we can take it and shape it and work on it, the idea of taking a long time to regrow it and to make it healthy is kind of contrary. People think, I will just trim it and shape it and slap a shoe on it and I'll make it look good. But it's not about how it looks. It's about how it feels. Mm, yes. Yes. Oh, I think yeah. that's an important point, isn't it? Yeah. So so the hoof itself, you know, we think about, and I know you explained earlier about the tips of your fingers and, and the relationship, the fingernail is a relationship to the wall. But how does the outer hoof support the interstructures? It's so interesting how everything inside the hoof is so balanced and designed so beautifully mm. that if if we can do self-trimming, which is something that we believe in, we have the horses on a track system, yep. and if we can have them barefoot on the track system, watch how that hoof is um, wanting to shape itself and support that, that the horses go sound. Because the, the outer wall is like the protective structure that takes care of the digital cushion and the coffin bone and keeps things in alignment and underneath where you have the sole and the frog. Um, all of this is working in alignment to make the leg, the shoulder, the hip, the back, everything stay in place. Mm-hmm. And the horse might have a little crack, a change in it. Something is happening with that wall. It's going to affect those internal structures. We had a mare that came to us with this blowout. Um, her hoof cracked and opened up. She came to us in sanctuary for this and several other reasons because she had a skull fracture and oh, all wow. these other things. Sure, she's yeah. got a story. Yeah. yeah. Oh, Clementine does. <laughs> but her hoof had opened up all the way to the coronary band. It was such a challenge, wow. and we have a barefoot tr- trimmer. We have a wonderful woman who comes and helps us, and she came to work on Clemmy, and she made it so that when she trimmed, so that when she stepped down, it didn't make the crack open up more. So by maintaining that little little bit of curve so that we didn't keep opening it, I packed the crack with Venice turpentine and then with warmed beeswax and repeated it and kept it clean, and she grew that crack all the way out. But it took time. Yeah. And and as that was growing out and continuing the treatments, we allowed the healing to happen. And that's a, a lot different than trying to force something to look good. Am I making sense with that? Oh, yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah, allowing that to happen. 
So that, that outer hoof is the protective layer for everything inside that works like mechanically a miracle to give this large animal who's walking essentially on four digits and then the hoof at the bottom that has the need for contact with the earth and flexibility, being able to flex is a part of pumping the blood back up and allowing um, traction. A horse with a with bare hooves has a lot better traction and a lot better ability to negotiate, you know, the ground yes. than a horse that's held held within a shoe. We're not against shoes. There can be times that they're useful and needed, but that's a temporary thing in, in our world. And often we find that that boots are even better. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. I think, you know, you always say about the comfort is the first priority mm-hmm. of care and you're not forcing to look good. Do you want to talk a little bit more about the comfort? We feel that way in, it, with the horses in so many ways that keeping them comfortable. And because we have horses with issues with their hooves very often, and that's why they've, they've been either surrendered or needed to be rescued or whatever has happened, they may not be comfortable holding one hoof up and putting weight on all the other three to get work done. So to keep them comfortable, we find ways. We can let them lean against a wall, hold the hoof lower. Uh, You have to get pretty creative so that what you're doing is not stressing them further while you're doing the work on the hoof. Then what you really want to do is that you have to consider um, that you're, you're allowing the hoof to show you how it needs to be trimmed. Yeah. And I say that a lot because because it's that allowing that makes things creative and makes things supportive. You've seen um, the Big Lick Tennessee walking horses, that they have these mm. long hooves and these giant pads and weights. And yep. I saw that a lot. I used to live back east in, in the U.S. And I saw them and was appalled by it. Mm. But a I, horse I worked act, in a stable yeah. in um, in the states in Florida, and they had Tennessee walking horses. Not where I was, yeah. we were eventing, but they had yeah. Tennessee walking horses that they brought for the summer. And there were times that they they just said, "No, you don't want to come in the barn today, Glenn. Don't come in the barn." Yes, you know, like yes. they would keep me out of oh. the barn. And I and I they talked about soaring, and I didn't get it. And yeah, oh. then I got it. Yeah, yeah. yes, yeah, terrible. It, yeah. It's just abhorrent. It's just this this one end of the spectrum mm. of overdoing things, doing too much, being having brutality. Mm. Then there's an end, another end that's neglect to the point of you know hooves curling up. There's yes. all these. Yes. Somewhere somewhere in the middle is the mm. place of comfort, and they want the horses to move in a certain way. They have this. It's all about looks. It's all about accomplishing something with them rather than looking at the well-being of the horse and this partnership. And we talk a lot about horses are in sanctuary because that's where they can be safe mm-hmm. and that's where they can heal. And in a sanctuary, we have to take a look at the hooves in a different way. It's, it's to hold them in comfort while we're trimming a hoof in between for whatever kind of ground they're walking on. If they need boots, we put boots on. If they need uh, support with herbs because they have inflammation and pain, we do that. If they need pharmaceuticals, we do that. Yep. Whatever it whatever it takes so that the horse doesn't suffer. Mm, mm, mm. Now, no. bacteria, how can that assist, assist the soul? It's very strange. Um, thrush is a bad thing. And yeah. um, thrush is something that eats, can eat up into the yes. tissues. Yes. Generally, it's just like when parasites will go after worms and mm. lice and all those things will go after the horse that's in a degraded condition. It doesn't have vibrant health. A horse who doesn't have vibrant health and healthy hooves is much more likely to have uh, yeast and bacteria and things growing in the hoof. But there's another aspect that's very weird to how the bacteria can work just like maggots will eat away at stuff and can be used in healing and leeches can pull pull the uh, clotted contaminated blood from something, sometimes the bacteria works its way under to allow the soul to slough off. Mm-hmm. And people people will get this need, like, like picking at a scab, and they will dig and dig and dig and dig out 
every little bit that they see of anything that has a different color. Oh, okay. and it's, yes. we'll, you know what I'm saying? They'll mm-hmm. dig out all mm-hmm. of this, this and make the horse sore. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. My personal belief is that you feed for health. You make sure your minerals are balanced. You use topicals. And, and for me, it's colloidal silver. It's um, a pack packing that we make for the hooves with zinc oxide, uh, green French clay, eucalyptus oil, and um, what else do we put in that? We make this wonderful, oh, honey. We use uh, local honey. And we mix this into a wonderful hoof putty. And that takes away pain. Yep. It kills thrush. You know that this is like the most wonderful putty when we use hoof boots. We grind lavender blossoms and we use that as the powder. And the lavender is is a wonderful disinfectant. So it keeps the bacteria from growing, keeps them from getting so stinky. Mm-hmm. And that's how we, we pack our hoof boots with a lavender powder instead of uh, oh, like wow. baby powder or something. Yeah, yeah, all, yeah. all of these things make an environment where the worst bacteria is not going to be there. But just like in our gut, we can have, we need good gut flora and there can be bad as well. Just like that within the hoof, nature has like this sense of knowing. And because the inner structures do need to uh, shed and slough, just like, you know, you don't want too much soul there because it feels like he's walking on a rock. But you, if you carve it all out all the time, then what you're doing is you're taking away the, the cushion itself. It's a fine line and a balance. But you want to fight the bad bacteria but not cut it out down to the sensitive tissue and then hope that the hoof is going to grow back healthy. You've got to address the, the cause and give the horse a chance to grow that hoof back out. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, it does. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Talking about this and also the wall, the wall of the hoof wears properly with exercise. And I know you use the track system, don't you? We do. Okay. Do you want to talk about that and how the track system's going to help the wall wearing properly with exercise? This is just such a wonderful thing as we Mm. keep returning our horses as close as possible to natural condition. And we were amazed. We just got the track system going this year. And when the horses first went on it, they just start walking it in a line as if they've been told how to use it. It's amazing. And the fact that they're just continuously in motion. We have feeding stations all over the place, shelters scattered, different kinds of shelters so they can find what they want. They get this herd dynamic, they're enjoying their lives, and they're in motion, in motion, in motion. And that's what the the hoof is designed. It grows so that as it's worn down, it doesn't wear, you know, away. It doesn't disappear. Well, as it's growing now, it's wearing in a natural way, and most of the horses are just self-trimming. And we're there to support, you know, if something chips or something needs to be... um, helped a little bit in keeping it it safe and keeping them balanced. But we're letting this happen and the the wall will wear down just how much it needs. What we're noticing with horses who um we had to trim so often, we had two mare we have two mares who were having to be trimmed often by our barefoot trimmer yep. and now on the track system, even though we gave them exercise before on the track system, they're keeping themselves trimmed, mm. and they're staying balanced, and they're they're landing heel first, and they're tracking up from behind, and they're muscling. It's been just a wonderful thing to have done, and more useful than we even imagined it would be. Okay. Mm. Oh, good, good. Now, the rock crunching. Tell us about how the rock crunching can toughen the hoof. This is our next thing to build, and my experience with rocks is an interesting one. Because um, I trained, I was training horses for an Arabian breeder in Hagerman in New Mexico. This is a place that's nothing but rocks. Yep. These horses, they were born on rocks. <laughs> we had an arena, it was nothing but rocks. You couldn't like drag the rocks away and find soil underneath. It was nothing but rocks. And these horses did not ever need to be trimmed. They were balanced and strong. If you went to try to do anything, the hooves were like stones themselves. But that was the strongest, most balanced hooves I've ever known. And I was amazed. And I was I was working with this fellow Stallion and some of his mares. Yeah. And I'm thinking, well, you know, they've been on this a long time. But you'd see it in the foals. 
And you're oh, thinking, wow. oh, gosh, mm. they're tiny little hooves. Yeah, but they were just strong and they, they got really balanced. Their conformation was nice. Mm -hmm. The rock crunching, the idea of having the, I would have buried terrain rather than have the horses just living on the stones. He had yep, no choice, yep. this, this breeder. But to give them the options and get them where they're on the very terrain and they're crunching on those rocks, they're going to take, let me say this, an already healthy hoof and keep it balanced and keep it mm -hmm, mm -hmm. strong. Yeah. 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 Now we talked a little bit before about the structure. Just go over the elastic footing and how that supports the coffin bone. That's a whole nother, you know, aspect <laughs> in this. Yes. Is that with horses that have any kind of issues, you know, internally with their hooves, mm -hmm. they're going to need the spongy footing that kind of uh, will push itself up in to the concavity of the hoof and support yep. it. Putting them, a horse that has foundered, it has a tendency toward laminitis, has any kind of internal structure issues, won't do well on the stones while they are in that acute stage. So they got to have like the spongy, good footing, the kind you want to ride your dressage on. That's the kind of footing we want. And a horse in that condition that has had these uh, issues internally in the structure, um, you don't want to uh, make that horse do a sudden turn, make that horse uh, do something that puts him the least bit off balance. Because what you have is you have that rocking side to side on the hoof, that torque on the internal structure, and that's excruciating for a horse that's having any kind of a laminitic mm -hmm. episode. Okay. Okay. And so like with our horses, I free lunge them on good fitting, and that way they're not on the lunge line with me kind of driving them on. And we do this in arena, not a round pin. And I direct them, and they'll circle me, and they'll find their own way so that if he if he's thinking he's going to step a little extra to the left, he knows he's going to do it. He lands flat with the hoof, not on the side and not torquing it. Does that make sense? <laughs> yes, 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 it does. Yeah. Uh, and I'm thinking, too, you know, about the, um, you know, elasticity and the cushion, the frog being a cushion. So how important is the frog in the rehabilitation? I I, well, I should say at all, you know, that the frog, that, that the frog being a cushion and how important is that in the horse's mm -hmm. hoof? It's so important. It's like it's the indicator underneath the the coffin bone that's giving the the support with the digital cushion to make it a cushion there. The whole thing with uh, people trimming or working on the frog to make it easier to pick out the hoof or something like that. What they're doing is the more you take away of it, the less support you have for those internal structures. The frog is so important. People will say it's the extra heart because it pumps the blood back up the leg. Um, it's much more than that. It is It is actually, if you think of your own finger yep. and that, that tip of your finger that you're, you're putting that down, that's like the the end of the horse's leg at his hoof. That bone in your finger is just like that coffin bone. And when you push down on something, you know, accidentally real hard, if you push down on that hard table, you feel it. Mm. And if you have a nice, big, cushy, frog-like object there uh, and you push down, it's going to – it takes the concussion and spreads it out. Just like the larger your saddle, the more it spreads the concussion out over the horse's yep. back. Yep. The larger the frog is, the more it spreads the concussion away from that center point where the poor coffin bone is sitting and the navicular bone right above it so that you are spreading it out. Make teeny little frogs and you, and you keep them from touching the ground. Their design is to touch the ground and you make it so none of that happens. The heels contract. The hoof hurts all the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I know before, you know, I mean, you're, you, you are concerned anyway about the horse's comfort, you know, and this is about gentle hoof care. But the right. comfort and making the hoof too small, you know, I know that you don't care very much mm -hmm. about, you know, forcing something to look good, but tell us what happens if you make the hoof too small. Oftentimes, that's, that comes from a philosophy of looking at it. How does it look? Mm-hmm as opposed to how do you think it feels? 
And if you think of the hoof as the foundation, you want a big foundation. I'm not talking about giant flares and spreading and things that that end up being detrimental. I'm talking about letting that hoof be the size that nature wants it to be. And when people shoe, I'm not I'm not degrading, denigrating shoeing, mm-hmm. but I'm saying that if you, you put the shoe, a metal shoe on, and the hoof will tend to not expand, so it's a little bit smaller. And over time, you're beginning to make that shoe a little bit smaller, a little bit smaller, because the hoof is going in that direction. Eventually, you've compromised it in such a way that you've made a smaller area of contact. And that really matters. You can think, well, he's, you know, big horse, he's okay. You know, it's a hoof. It's a strong thing. For a horse, the size that he is, that base is very small. Mm. There's four of them, and you want them each to be functioning the best they can to make the hoof smaller. And especially if you trim and the horse is sore after you trim, then something's not right. Yes. yes. We have the a horse, horse is telling you. Yeah, the have, fact that they're sore, they're telling yeah, you something's telling wrong. You. Yep. They're telling you something. We had a horse that came in shoes, and once again, some horses need shoes at certain times, but this horse came in shoes completely unable to walk from the driveway to his pen. Mm. And we pulled those shoes right away, and we didn't trim him or mess with his hooves. We left them to wear the way he wanted. Glennis, in four months, he competed in the Las Cruces horse trials, wow. and he took second in his division. And you know, at a horse trials, there's veterinarians that watch. Yeah. If horse is not sound, it doesn't go on. Wow. Isn't wow. that cool? Uh, is, yeah. That's really good, yeah. really good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good news. And, yeah. and I think you've got lots of good news stories. You know, I think the whole equine sanctuary, I'm sure you've, you know, we, we could keep talking all day, but I do want you to come back on I know, because I, I think your whole system of horse care and caring for horses and doing it as naturally yeah. as you can and, and doing it without costing a million dollars too, you know, I think that's important. Because that, for us, yeah, we don't have a million. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, Catherine, if people like to contact you, I know they can contact you through Dharma Horse. And even if you go to horsechats.com and search for Dharma Horse or search for Catherine Schreiber, you'll get it. But what's the best way? Is it the Dharma Horse website? It is. The website has the phone number, address, my email, ways to get in touch, and all about us. Yep. It has links to our newsletters, and the newsletters all have um, uh, herbal information, information about what we're doing, uh, our colic charts, those kind of things. So on the home page, there's even our newsletters, old archived newsletters to look at. We just want to bring as much information as possible about the things that we do that we find successful because we're doing these with the well-being of the horse as a priority. Mm, yes, yes, I think mm. very important. So if people would like to contact, go to dharmahorse.org or come to Horse Chats, mm-hmm. search for Dharma Horse, search for Catherine, and um, search for New Mexico, I'm sure. If you search for New Mexico, they'd find you on uh, on Horse <laughs> Chats. I think the search search um, is quite good there. Cool. So, yeah, Catherine, thank you, and uh, certainly looking forward to catching up with you again. Thank you so much, Glennis. Okay, bye. Bye Bye-bye. If you've enjoyed this chat, then please comment, rate, and subscribe. If you'd like any changes or recommendations for guests, then please contact us through horsechats.com. And while you're online, have a look at the government-accredited courses at internationalhorsecollege.com. Registered Training Organisation 31352. Remember that our comments and instructions are general in nature and do not take into consideration your individual horses or your individual ability and circumstances. If you enjoyed this podcast, then please leave your comment below 